Hello, everyone around the world. And I do mean everyone because, you know, everyone listens to this podcast, don't they? Um, Welcome to this new episode. Now, I just wanted to let you know, um, right at the beginning, that I've been working on the Wispolep competition and it's coming soon. Okay. That's why I should be on Luke's English podcast, the Wispolep competition. The next installment is coming soon. I will let you know exactly what I've decided to do, how I've decided to carry out the competition. I will play you recordings from listeners and you will be able to vote. And we're going to find a Lepster to be interviewed on the podcast. So the next installment of why I should be on Luke's English podcast is coming soon. Also, some premium content is coming. I'm working on it. In the meantime, just a reminder that I recently uploaded a 28-minute video of one of my stand-up comedy shows. It's me doing stand-up in London a couple of years ago. It's a video I'd been holding on to for a while, actually, but I finally decided it was time to publish it, considering I'm not doing any gigs at the moment and I'm not sure when I'll be able to do gigs again. So, premium subscribers, check out the video 28 minutes of me doing stand-up. You can check that out if you're a premium subscriber, as well as all the other stuff like all the pronunciation videos I've uploaded and at least 100 premium episodes. Uh, Teacherluke.co.uk slash premium info if you want to sign up or you'd like to know more. Also, you can expect more free episodes coming, obviously, including the next Whisper Lep episode and more conversations with guests. I've been doing um, a lot of interviews Uh, on the podcast recently, as you've probably noticed. It's been a really good run of guests, I think. Lots of people that we haven't heard before on the podcast. But I will go back to the old favourites soon enough, with hopefully Amber and Paul making a return, and an episode of Jill's Book Club. That's where I talk to my mum about books. And the book in question, the next book we're going to talk about, here's a little heads up for you, The next book that I'm going to talk to my mum about will be 1234 The Beatles in Time by Craig Brown. That's 1234 The Beatles in Time by Craig Brown. An interesting recent book which explores the story of the Beatles in various interesting ways. So we'll be doing that in the new year, I think, because I'm getting the book for Christmas and I'll need a chance to read it. Um, I think it'll it will basically be a chance for me to talk about the Beatles with my mum. And she was a huge fan back in the Beatlemania days, and she saw them live twice and everything. As you may know, because episode three of this podcast was actually a conversation with her about seeing the Beatles. So anyway, if you are interested, you might want to get that book, 1234 by Craig Brown. And Jill's Book Club, it's it doesn't happen that regularly, but uh, we do plan to look at some of the classics as well. Maybe a, p- a bit of classic literature, as well as some of the modern stuff we've been doing. So anyway, on to this episode now. This is episode 690, I believe. Isn't it? Is it? Isn't it? I've lost track. Hold on a second, I'll, I'll tell you. No, this is ex- this is going to be episode 691. It's hard to keep track at the moment for some reason. So uh, this one is all about pronunciation. So get ready to think about accents and changing the way that you speak. It also goes quite nicely with other episodes like the recent one I did about key features of English accents. That was 682. So the question for us to consider is how can you change your accent? Let's ask a dialect coach. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello, everyone. Here's an episode all about accents and dialects, and specifically how to convincingly sound like you come from a different place with a different accent. You're going to hear me in conversation with Jerome Butler, who's a dialect coach. Jerome works with actors who need to change the way they speak. To give you an example of what this means, like actors who want to change the way they speak, to give you an example, let's say, let's just imagine that I'm an actor from England and I've got a part in a TV show that takes place in the USA, in a southern state, let's say. Perhaps the film is set in Atlanta or something like that, like in The Walking Dead 
perhaps, which is set in Atlanta. And let's say that the character I'm playing was born and grew up in that area. And so I need to change my RP English accent to a general southern accent from the USA for the filming of the show. And this is just, this is a hypothetical situation. I need to say that because there's always someone who goes, what, Luke, you're going to be in The Walking Dead? Calm down. No, it's just, we're just being hypothetical here. So how would I do that? How would I change my accent to sound like I'm from Atlanta? How can I change my voice? How can I consistently speak like I'm from a southern state in the USA or in fact any other place? Well, I would need a dialect coach and that is what Jerome does. Actually, having to change your accent is quite common for actors in the English language TV and film industry. There are loads of famous actors who've successfully changed the way they speak for different roles. I mentioned The Walking Dead before, and it is quite a good example. So many of the actors in that show are from the UK, in fact. Did you know that? Loads of the actors are from the UK, and I don't mean the zombies because of the, the, the bad skin and uh, dodgy teeth. Ha ha ha, no. Um, some of the main characters are actually British, but they sound like they could come from Georgia or a neighbouring state. Uh, no doubt those actors worked closely with dialect coaches like Jerome. And it's not just British actors working in the USA. It's anyone who normally speaks in one way and needs to learn to speak in another way. And remember, the English language is so diverse in terms of accents and dialects across different parts of the world that it's very common for actors to have to make this kind of change in their work. Now, talking to Jerome about this is actually a great opportunity for us to listen to someone who has a lot of experience and expertise in helping people change their accents. He's been doing it for years now and has worked on loads of different film and TV projects and with loads of different actors from different parts of the world. Jerome is amazing, actually, and we're really lucky to have him on the podcast. I really enjoyed talking to him and it was very interesting to find out the specifics of what he does in his job. For you as learners of English, this should be particularly interesting because the whole point of this conversation is to answer two questions, really. And those questions are, firstly, how can actors change their accents and dialects for different roles? And secondly, what can learners of English take from the way actors do this in order to apply it to their language learning? So how can you change your accent? It's quite a complicated question, as you can expect. It involves many linguistic factors and a lot of work. In just a one-hour conversation, we can't give you all the answers, of course. It's a complex and very personal process. But at least we can get a sort of window into that process by listening to what Jerome has to say. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Jerome's CV before we listen to him talking. This is like his his career, the basic de- details of, well, some of the details of his career, just so you can get an idea of who you're talking to. So Jerome Butler has had a really diverse career working for over 25 years in acting, teaching and dialect coaching. He graduated from the Juilliard School, which is one of the most prestigious acting and performance art schools in the USA. Have you ever heard of Juilliard? Loads of great actors went there, including well-known people like Adam Driver, Jessica Chastain, Oscar Isaacs, Anthony Mackie, Robin Williams and plenty of others. He's done various acting roles in theatre, TV and film productions, even including episodes of things like Star Trek, Voyager and ER. Uh, I think he played a Klingon in one episode of Star Trek and he was in ER and stuff. But the majority of the work that he's done in the industry is that of a dialect coach. And if you look at his IMDb page, IMDb, that's the Internet Movie Database. If you look at his page on the IMDb, then the list just goes on and on, working on various productions with various performers, including some big names that you might recognise like Emily Mortimer, Tom Hardy, Gerard Butler, Robert Downey Jr., Jonathan Price and Chiwetel Ejiofor. Impressive. Most impressive. So, yes, I just dropped a bunch of names on you there, didn't I? But this episode is not a celebrity gossip type thing. It's not about that. I'm not asking him to tell us what Robert Downey Jr. is really like and stuff. 
I just wanted to let you know that Jerome is a proper professional dialect coach who has lots of real industry experience, so he definitely knows what he's talking about. He's also taught classes at universities like MIT and has been involved in an artistic rehabilitation program in the California prison system. So that's quite a glittering and diverse CV. And of course, now he's reached the absolute high point of his professional career. Yes, appearing in an episode of Luke's English Podcast. Um, In this conversation, we start by talking about the work he does and what it involves. And the conversation gets more and more specific as it goes, as we try to understand what he does and relate that to your learning of English. Now, I would also like to say that I think as a learner of English, the decision to change your accent, or perhaps I should say the decision to try to sound exactly like a native speaker of English, that decision is completely up to you. But in the EFL, ESL community, that's English as a foreign language or English as a second language, in the teaching English community, this is actually quite a contentious issue. Should learners of English aim to or expect to ultimately sound exactly like native English speakers? People seem to disagree about this. Even now, I can sense, using my Jedi Force abilities, that some of you are saying, yes, we should try to sound like native speakers. Whereas other people are saying, no, we shouldn't. And probably most of you are saying, I don't really know, Luke, I haven't made up my mind. And a couple of you also are saying, sorry, what was the question? Let me repeat it. Should learners of English spend time and effort and possibly money on trying to sound exactly like native speakers? Should we all aim for native level speech as our ultimate goal in learning other languages? Or is it better to keep your accent when you speak English because this is all part of who you are and it's perhaps even damaging to set such high standards? These are questions that are often discussed and people continue to disagree on the answers. To an extent, it is a question of personal choice. People can do whatever they like and if sounding like a native speaker is your personal goal, then fine. Uh, Some people manage to do it very well. One thing's for sure, nobody can argue against the importance of intelligibility and that means being understandable and clear. But exactly who you should sound like seems to be up to you. But anyway, I felt I should mention this whole argument in the introduction here, and Jerome mentions it too, before going on to describe the specifics of how someone could shift their accent if they wanted to. Also, keep listening to hear Jerome start training me to speak in that Southern American accent that I mentioned earlier. Can he help me learn to speak like I'm in The Walking Dead and I'm from a southern state like Georgia or Tennessee or South Carolina or maybe even Alabama. You can find out by listening all the way through. Okay, I'll talk to you again at the end of this conversation in order to recap and sum up some of the main points that are made here. But now let's start this conversation with me in Paris and Jerome Butler across the Atlantic in New York City. Jerome, hello. Welcome to the podcast. How are you today? I'm very well. Thank you, Luke. I'm very, very happy to be here. Very nice to have you with me. So where to start? Well, I guess the first thing I can ask you is the old classic question that people always ask when they meet each other at parties and stuff like that. Um, What do you do? I'm a dialect coach for film and television production. Right. So what's that then? Basically, I help actors move from their home dialects to a dialect that's more appropriate for the character that they're playing. Okay. It's as simple as I can put it. So do you think it's necessary to make a distinction between dialect and accent at this point? Where where do you make that distinction? I think a dialect comes down to usage, word usage, uh, you know, vocabulary, uh, structure, syntax, and an accent will, these are very loose categories, and then an accent would probably 
deal more with vowels and consonants, uh, pronunciation. Yeah. But, but those, I mean, most people use dialect and, and, and accent interchangeably. And certainly in terms of my job, calling me a dialect coach has become the default and it encompasses all the things that an accent coach would do as well. It's just a, I think it just sounds better to the ear. Maybe it, maybe it results in, in a higher pay scale. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. You wouldn't get paid as much if you're an accent coach, a dialect coach. Sounds. Yeah, yeah, maybe not, because anybody could be an accent coach, couldn't they? I don't know. I mean, um, uh, I'm, yeah, my, I mean, my tongue is my tongue is firmly in my cheek. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, we're splitting hairs, I guess, um, I, for sure. Yeah, for but sure. You, so, in the work that you do as a dialect coach, working with actors, then, mm-hmm. um, what specifically does that involve? What I will do is, especially in this day and age, it it varies. Sometimes I will work with somebody just for a few sessions to uh, get them ready for an audition, perhaps, or perhaps a producer will call me up and say, hey, we just want you to do a couple of sessions with this person to get them ready for shooting. Maybe they're a small uh, film and and it's important and you know and the the actor just mm-hmm. wants a little something to boost their confidence and set them on the right track and it will go all the way to being on set every day which yeah. uh, which you know I'm doing right now on a on a show on a television show um, that that shoots here in New York. Can you tell us about the show? Sure. It's called For Life. Uh, It's, uh, or should I say, For Life. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I think so. I guess, is that, how how is everyone describing, are they calling it For Life? Well, I think what just occurred to me as I said it, if I say For Life, then that could mean that the show is about things that are good for life, as opposed to for life implies a duration. Yes. So, for example, I'm going to, you know, uh, potentially I'm going to live in Paris for life. That means permanently. But yes. for life means you do it uh, as a way of improving your life. Yes. Yes. Because it actually joie de vivre. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and this show is about uh, an, a man who is wrongfully imprisoned. And through a through hard work and a loophole in the system, he actually becomes a lawyer, gets his law degree, and is able to practice law as an inmate. Okay, but he's in prison he's for in, life. He's in prison. That's correct. Yes, he's uh, in prison. So I guess it is for life. In that sense, that yes, he's permanently in in jail. Yes, yes. that uh, we. Uh, I'm talking to the listeners now. Um, I guess Jerome raised that point because it's not specific to that particular phrase, but it's true in English generally that often when you you know st- the the way that we stress certain words in a sentence can make a difference, and it's quite. There are a few uh, like um, phrases where stressing one of the words gives it a different impact anyway let's get back to the point shall we but so no, where, but, but but hold on yeah. but hold on yeah. this is actually interesting because i i love what you do and i'm hoping that there are things that have to do with what i do that are going to be useful for your audience so along the mm. lines of what you're saying here's something that i encounter uh in people that i work with because i'll also work with actors whose first language may not be english yes so for example, in Spanish uh, and in other languages, but in Spanish, if you were to say uh, uh, la casa grande, the big house, then you would you you're, you're stressing grande, la casa grande, right? Mm. But mm. and then so I will have sometimes uh, someone who I'm working with who who will want to say I live in the big house, and yeah. 
And it's only because they're accustomed to stressing the adjective. And uh, in English, it, it, it's not the big house. It's the big house. Now, mm. what's interesting about it is that if it's adjective subject, then, or adjective noun, then you're going to stress the noun. But if it's the name of a thing, then you're going to give them equal stress or maybe even a bit more stress on the first syllable. So if I'm going away to the big house, that means I'm going to prison because that is the slang name for prison. I could talk about um, that is a big tree or I'm going to go to the big tree restaurant. Yeah. 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 That's right. Okay. <laughs> How do I get back to what we were talking about? Well, what was it? Well, that's it, it. The name of the, the name of the show. The name life. of the show for life for life. And, and so it's, it's a wonderful show uh, on, on ABC. It's uh, it's doing very well. Uh, people seem to like it. It's based on a true story um, uh, about a, about a man, Isaac Wright Jr. Uh, who was falsely imprisoned and, uh, uh, found a way to get out. So who are you working with uh, on the show? Um, I'm working with two wonderful actors, uh, Nicholas Pennock and Indira Varma, both from the UK. Oh, really? Who are playing Americans. Ah, right. So the, here's where we get to the real business of, of what you do then. So they, yes. um, how do they speak normally then? Like citizens of the British Isle. Right. The, um, you don't know which is, specific part they're from? Is that actually a, a thing that you would still say? What, the uh, British, I the yes, British Isles? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. I mean, I think I think the British Isles is a geographical term. The only yes. thing you've got to be careful with when you uh, say the British Isles is yes, that I think I there's an yeah, island, right? Because um, Ireland, I think, is geographically <laughs> part of the British Isles, although Irish people might not like just the the word british being included in there yes no i i i, I as soon as it came out of my mouth I, I realized that i was stepping in it and these things are you know all of these it, it's the world that we're living in now and you know what we call things and how we refer to things i mean they're they're very fraught potentially yeah um but but both nicholas and uh indira have uh, very standard uh, British accent. Uh, Going back to that British Isles thing, if they're not from Ireland, you're fine, I yeah. think. Mm -hmm. then, yeah, you're basically fine if, as long as they're not Irish. Uh, but okay, it's just sort of standard English accents a bit like mine then. And so yes. what, are the, mm -hmm. what about the characters that they're playing? Uh, they're both from New York. Okay. They're sort both of... playing New York accent. Well, they're, they're playing characters who grew up in the New York area. And uh, okay. so they okay. have they have East Coast uh, accents. Uh, well, they have New York accents, both of them, really. Like kind of standard New York accents, because I guess in New York, um, there's one is a bit of one is the Bronx, and the other is Queens, more more of a Queens style. Okay, um, okay, yeah, okay, cool. This sounds this sounds really cool. When for for me personally, when I think of stuff like the Bronx and Queens and Brooklyn, lots of accents come to mind. I don't, I never know which one is which, of course. Um, you know, there's I, a, there's a lot of mixing and, and here's what I think when it comes to accents or what accent would fit where someone is from. Yes, there are characteristics that go with accents from certain, uh, geographic reasons uh regions for mm. sure uh but oftentimes our perception of those things have to do with our own personal experiences people that we uh met um people that we know from those areas uh perhaps we lived in that area and you know some you know the the particular area that we lived in and the sounds we were accustomed to hearing there but in actuality there is so much more uh, mixing and and um and merging and 
yeah. cross pollinization that happens um, with uh, with with dialects and accents, you know, in the world. And what's interesting is when you're doing a um, you know a dramatic uh, show, when you're doing when you're creating a piece of art. Well, then that's the thing about creating a piece of art. You know, whether you're uh, writing a story or you're you're painting a picture or you're composing a piece of music, there there wants to be a unity because you are with that piece of art. You are manipulating um, the person who uh, who the art is for the audience for you're manipulating their their senses. You're trying to actually create the illusion of something that is going on, you know. Um, so that they actually have an experience when they, when they encounter that piece. So, mm. so a lot of times when it comes to, to, uh, you know, theatrical presentations, it can get, uh, really tricky because our perception of something theatrical that's happening is that we're actually watching something that is really going on, especially if it's done in a realistic style. Uh, and, and, but it's not, you see, it's not really going on. And, and that show, every aspect of that show, the way they speak, the camera angles, the color palette, the way the, uh, you know, the way the, uh, the clothes that the, the actors are wearing, they, it's all been specifically designed to have a particular effect. Um, mm. So, so these are things that, um, so it, I think it's important to, I think you can get a, for your audience, there's a tremendous amount that can be learned from watching television, uh, yeah. or movies as far as getting a sense of how people will speak, uh, uh a language. Yeah. That, but, I mean, that's, uh, that, I guess from, for my listeners, that just shows that, you know, the, um, watching, watching all these TV shows can actually be very good practice, which is, you know, one of the great things about having so yeah. many streaming platforms these days, there's yes. so much content available and it's all, it's all very useful and beneficial for people learning English around the world. But it's not uh, the only way. That's the only point that I'm making. Mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. Just because, you know, just because on our show, the characters speak like this, that's not the only way that people speak uh, in New York. And, um, oh, you mean there's, there, there might be a tendency to sort of drift into, um, like, um, what stereotyping potentially? But, yeah, potentially. And, and ultimately, and this is something that I'm really interested in speaking with you about, uh, in, in terms of, in terms of language acquisition, mm. really when, when push comes to shove, what you want is to understand what is being communicated to you and you want what you communicate to be received by uh, other parties. And once you've got that, well, then really, uh, unless you're an actor or a spy, your job <laughs> is done. It, yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's it's good that you brought that up because I was, I was thinking about how to sort of uh, mention that myself, that... This is, a, this is where we get into the question of identity. Um, now, from my experience, um, just working with learners of English from around the world, yeah. so many people out there want to speak exactly like me or want to speak like a quote-unquote native speaker of English. Mm. Um, now, I mean, you know, that's up to them, isn't it, really, I suppose? It's their choice. But like you said, and I agree with what you said, um, ultimately, the most important thing is that people understand each other so clarity has to be the first thing but still it's interesting that y uh, you are a professional who helps people to sound like other people mm -hmm. right yes um and um so first and foremost you work with actors um but do you do, do you do you have experience of applying this to to other people for other reasons too yes i do Absolutely. Can, can you tell us a little bit about, about those things? Um, uh, you know, there, the, the biggest thing that I'll say about it is that it's less 
because of the whole illusion um, uh, mm. factor when you're creating a work of art, again, what's really, I can't think of anything more frustrating than being fluent in a language and understanding everything that's being said to you. And because of your pronunciation, people, it's a barrier between you and other people. That's got to be so frustrating. And, and first of all, my admiration goes out to individuals who have learned a language that is not their home language. I mean, I live in America and, and the majority of people have not done that. They, they speak one lang uh, speak one language. Mm -hmm. And, and so I have a lot of admiration for individuals who've for whatever reason have made taken the effort and uh made the leap and reached out and actually learned a, a, another language um and you know so i can understand that frustration of constantly every time you open your mouth you feel like um somebody's asking you a question having to do with how you talk you know Often the question will simply be, oh, where, where are you from? Yes. And it, and it doesn't, it's not meant to be, to be harmful, but you know, it, people get tired. If somebody asked me every day, oh, where did you buy that shirt? I'd get a little tired of that question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, or I would change my shirt. Um, <laughs> yeah. Or you just get really annoyed with everyone and you just wouldn't leave the house or, or whatever. Yeah. But, yeah, that's actually, yeah. that's or, actually not a bad analogy for somebody who doesn't experience this. It, it, it's, it can be, um, it, it's, you know, it's unnecessarily, uh, uh, there's a level of self-consciousness that, that comes with it. So I can understand people wanting to, to raise their, their level of, of clarity um, and I think that it is important um, to to understand that that aspect of it. And one, it's one of the things that uh, that I've tried to do at my website, dialectcoachescorner dot com, is I've I've tried to create tools where uh, I can not only send actors that I work with, uh, but I can also have people who um, uh, haven't worked with a dialect coach, uh, but have uh, learned another language and they want to work on their pronunciation. What I do, I'm not an English teacher, but I do know something about helping uh, an individual raise their comfort level with speaking English. That I do know something about. And I've got a lot of different tools at Dialect Coaches Corner that people can use, practice sheets, audio files that people can go through. Uh, there's a course on uh, accent modification that people can go through that, that talk about some of the issues. Because ultimately, what we're really talking about is getting more comfortable with what your personal specific issues are. Because if you can continue to engage with those issues, uh, over time, you're going to get better. Yes, absolutely. Let's see. Let talk to me about specific things that you do with actors. Then let's say I. Oh, well, maybe not me because I'm not. I'm not. And maybe you can try and get me to speak like someone from New York later on. Uh, but um, working with an actor who wants to sound like they come from the Bronx, then hmm. what are some of the specific steps that you go through uh, when helping them do it? And I wonder if these are things that can be applied to to helping learners of English do the same thing. We can, we can talk about the this, this sort of differences in those situations maybe in a bit, but um, yeah, exactly how do you help someone speak differently? Well, I think that the, the, the techniques that you use are definitely applicable to individuals who want to improve their accents as they're uh, learning English, especially if they've run into a wall, you know, and they have a level of fluency, but it's not translating in terms of the way that they speak it. Um, but I help people understand, linguists call them minimal sets, right? Mm -hmm. And basically it's containers that 
words can be placed in. And so I'll help an actor to understand what the sound changes want to be from the way that they speak normally. If you were to wake them up at three in the morning, how they would sound, how they would make an E sound or an I sound or Mm. a TH sound or the right. Mm. And I help them understand what this category is. I help them get comfortable with what that category contains. I help them understand the difference between this category and the the one right next to it, right? And right. and through this process of saying, okay, for this particular accent, you're going to you make the sound like this we're going to want to make the sound in this particular way to create the illusion that you are from this area. Right. So could that, could that be just things like noticing how people make uh, produce certain vowel sounds and then shifting those vowel sounds over to the way it's done in the target accent or dialect is it that sort of thing that's exactly what it is that you explained it much better than (laughs) than than i did and i'm gonna i'm gonna steal that i should have said that that's exactly what i'm talking about uh uh, that's exactly what i'm talking about so feel free to steal the so steal my words right absolutely (laughs) um so so with actors it's just getting it's just creating that that awareness of what the issues are. And Mm. the same is true when you're, because everybody from a, uh, everybody from everyone from whatever language group you come from has different issues, right? Mm. They, they have different things that they need to deal with. And in your job, um, you're there to, uh, you have an understanding of what these different issues are, but you're really helping people crack the code in terms of grammar, uh, understanding that it, it, if you if you say it like this, it means this, and if you say it like that, it mm-hmm. means something else, and 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 helping understand the mechanics, right? Mm. And once yeah, somebody yeah. once somebody understands the mechanics, then there's another element that has to do with just being able to have the sounds fall out in a way that are going to be received that 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 reach the listening space of the person that you're going to be speaking with. And the other part of it is it depends on where you live. Right? The listening mm. space is different in the UK than it is in New York, than it is if you were in Mississippi, right? You mean um, in in the UK, for example, we uh, um, maybe just expect to hear certain words pronounced in certain ways? Exactly. Yeah, that that we live in a sort of linguistic context that... So so if... if, hmm, um, I'm trying to think of an example here. Uh, um, I I reckon... reckon yeah, go on. Go well, on. well, I was working in South Africa, and yeah. I asked someone a question, and um, he said, uh, "Well, it's just in the car." And I said, "What?" He says, "No, it's just in the car." And I and 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 I I I, I asked him like two, three times. Yeah. And finally, I says, "Oh, it's in the car." Okay. 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 <laughs> Okay. And in that particular moment, because it was a sort of a fragmented phrase, it did not fit into the context. I wasn't expecting a car to be involved in the, in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Right. So I didn't expect him to be saying it. So he just said a series of sounds. I didn't know what he said. And because he wasn't rounding off the R in the word car, as you'd expect as an American person, right? and because there wasn't enough context that made you realize, oh, he's talking about a car. Yeah. You were just like, what is this, what is this car thing that he's yeah, talking I about? I don't know what you're talking about. I just, you know, <laughs> I just, and that's the thing, uh, you know, context is everything. What you expect, I mean, most of the time when people are together, they don't, they're not listening to each other. They're guessing. Based, mm-hmm. based on who you are, what the situation is, 
what I expect from you. You say something to me. I, 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 I'm going to pretty much know what you said, because if, if it's lunchtime and you say, Jeet, I yeah. know that you said, did you eat? Yeah. I'm going to say, no, Jew. And no, did you? So, so we're going to have that exchange and we're going to be completely clear and we're going to sync up with each other. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, maybe I'm saying something different, but you, you know, the context says I'm saying this, right? And that's what people do all the time. Yes. Right? Totally. That's why, for example, here in France, when I say things with my English accent, I might say the right words in French. I mean, I might say the right yes. words, but because I've just sort of said them in a slightly different way, it completely floors the person. You know, I can say, I don't know, I'm just trying to think of an example. Yeah. I mean, every day I go to the bakery and I buy bread and if it's not you know, the standard thing of like deux baguettes, si vous play, which is easy, or deux, tra deux traditions, which is easy. Yes. If it's something more complicated. So my wife likes bread, which is called pan de seigle, okay? Which is, I guess, like wholemeal bread or something like that in English. And what I need to do when I go to the bakery is I need to say, um, can I have some pan de seigle? Uh, I want a quarter of a loaf sliced please. Yes. Which is quite complicated. So that's un pan de seigle, uh, un quart de seigle tranché, s'il vous plaît. And because of my accent, I can almost never successfully, you know, it's always like, what, what, what? And then I have to say it again and they don't slice it. And then, you know, like, oh, sorry, can you slice it? You know, it's just like it's such a complicated transaction because even though I'm saying the right words, yes, because I'm not delivering them in the exactly the right way that they are used to hearing is just gone, completely gone for them. Well, you know, you need a dialect coach. I do. Yeah. You, you, you need, you need to practice that phrase and actually figure out. I'm, 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 I'm this is a metaphor. I'm not really mm. telling you what you should do, mm. but, mm. but it, it, you know, if you were to take that phrase practice that phrase, actually spend some time with somebody and understand exactly what they were mishearing, right? Then mm. you would fix your ability to, uh, you would fix that transaction. And once you fixed that transaction, that would just do wonders for your confidence. Yeah, You would go in and you, because there's a tiny bit of tension every time you go in there. Yeah. Tell because because you know and your throat kind of gets tight you know so a, as a dialect coach or as an accent coach or as a speech coach or as someone who helps somebody uh with accent modification that's exactly what i'm doing i'm going in and making it clear to them this is what's happening i know in your mind it makes sense and i know you you know what the words are supposed to be. But based on where you are, try it like this and we'll practice those things. We'll actually practice saying, you know, what do you want instead of what do you want? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and this is an American style of speech and, yeah. and, and we'll get people to get comfortable uh, with that. And that's exactly what I do with actors. And there's no reason why uh, someone who is just wanting to uh, improve their level of clarity can't do the exact same thing. Because what I'm doing, what, what I do when I'm working with an actor, we will go through a session. Most of the work though happens when that actor is practicing on their own outside of class. So I will say, okay, what I want you to do is we've looked at these pages on my website and mm -hmm. I, I, and I created the website so that I would have a place where I could send actors after we worked, as opposed to saying, you got to buy this book and then you got to have the, no, no. It's like, we actually use these pages during the session. And then I say, okay, I want you to go back to that page. I want you to work that page. I want you to work this page. I want you to work this page. Right. And, mm. and, and through repetition, repetition is my mother of skill, you know, a mm. uh, self-improvement uh, guru once said, and 
that's how things happen. You just have to, that's what kids do. They throw themselves into the mix and they just keep making mistakes um, until the brain clicks over. And it will. Yeah, yeah you got to get it wrong loads of times before you can get it right. Loads of times. And then when you start to get it right, then the brain's like, I've got it, I've got it now, I've got it. And then the confidence comes in. Um, I've got a question about working with actors. So do you, um, I guess, working with actors, often there's a script. Yes. So are you kind of, do you work only on the things that are in the script and just get the actor to to learn how to say those specific lines? That is, is, that's an awesome question. That is an absolutely great question because the answer is no. I do not. Hmm. I do hmm. not only work on the script. I think the script may be the last thing that I get to unless we have to do it tomorrow. And why, you, you know, why is that? Sorry. Because why? I want the actor to feel confident in the sounds coming out of their mouth in the appropriate way. I don't want the actor to feel like, oh, well, I can, you know, okay, the, what's the line? The line is, uh, I left the phone on the table. I left the phone and I left the phone. I left, okay, don't say the T. I left the phone on the table. I left the phone. I left the phone on the table, you know. So they get that line and then they get there and maybe uh, the director says, you know what, we... Uh, you know what? It, it, the, we we had to rewrite the script. It's not a phone. It's it's now it's a TV that has been stolen. So now I, we need you to say uh, the television uh, was on the table when I left. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, you know, you're thrown. Or even worse, they keep the line the same, and you only have one way to say it. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, what I want to do is when I'm working with an actor is identify what are the things that are getting in the way? What are the stumbling blocks? And then we fix those stumbling blocks so that whenever that will, that stumbling block comes up, it actually gets dealt with effectively. Okay. So if, for example, um, in, uh, in, in a general American accent, Mm -hmm. You you would uh, minimize a, a consonant T that would be next to an N, right? So you would say uh, um, brilliantly. So I can't now. I can't. I can't. Um, I'm trying to think of one with the word can't. Uh, followed by an N word. I can't. Remember. Well, no, I meant no? that I, if I said followed by a, a T, I'm, I, what I meant to say was a T next to an N, but following an N, right? If I said the oh, opposite, okay. I, I apologize. So, um, so I would say brilliantly. Okay. And you hear, I'm not making that T. I'm saying brilliantly. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually having you perceive the T by making it a slightly different way. I'm not taking the tip of my tongue and putting it on my gum ridge to say brilliantly, mm. right? Mm. And so you don't hear that. It's almost as if I'm throwing the T away brilliantly. Brilliantly, brilliantly. Yeah, yeah, because exactly. there's th I'd say there's three ways of saying it. So there's there's one way you definitely make a T sound brilliantly. Yes, which is actually not how I I wouldn't say it like that either. Brilliantly, but there, almost there nobody would. Yeah, and then the other one is where you put the your tongue into the position to make the T sound, but you don't go for the full T sound. So that would be brilliantly. That would be unaspirated. Yes, absolutely. unaspirated. Yeah, mm -hmm. but the t but the tongue goes into the position, but it doesn't aspirate the T. Yes, and that's how I would say it brilliantly. Yeah. Okay, but you're saying that in the general American way of speaking, um, you don't even put the tongue into the position. You just it's just absent completely. So brilliant, brilliantly. Yeah, I don't need to because the N is making the the articulation in pretty much the same place. Yeah. So brilliantly, brilliantly. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. And if I need to do any closing, I'll do it in the back of my throat. Brilliantly. Ah, 
Brilliantly. Yeah, that's that. It's interesting because that's almost like a sort of Cockney glottal stop as well. Brilliant. Brilliantly. Yeah, but see, what you can't take, you see, an American wouldn't go that far. And I have to be careful when I speak to someone who has a Cockney background about getting, you know, I don't even mention about using the stop in the back of the throat. Just, right. just, just going up there with the N is enough. Brilliantly. Brilliantly. Um, yeah. He did that brilliantly. Hmm. Whereas I would say he did that brilliantly. N- brilliant. N- brilliantly. Yes. Br- brilliantly. Brilliantly. Yeah. So, yeah. so if I'm working with somebody who has that in a line, right? I, mm-hmm. I don't want to spend a bunch of time on that one word. I want to spend time on that concept. So as soon as that becomes something that we're aware of needs to be dealt with, I'll go to my pages. I'll go to my, my nasal T page and we'll just drill those words. We'll drill the words. We'll drill the phrases. We'll drill the sentences. You see? Mm -hmm. And then they, then you've got it. It's all about, it's just like, um, look, if, if, Let's say that I'm uh, practicing tennis, right? And I'm I'm making this up out of whole cloth. I've never used this metaphor before. But <laughs> so if I'm playing tennis and and you want to help me with my stroke, uh, uh, you know, um, on on uh, where I'm going to be, you want me to do a uh, a short stroke because the ball has come close to my feet, right? Okay. I'm not going to just work on that stroke like in one part of the court. I'm going to work on that stroke wherever it happens. Cause the problem is that I'm having to do something different because the ball is cl- The ball lands closer to my feet than I expect it to. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to fix because it's not a normal stroke, you know, a classic normal stroke. Right. Uh, every mm, tennis mm. player is saying this guy doesn't, this guy's know nothing about <laughs> tennis. And in fact, I don't, but, but the point is you work on that. So wherever that happens, you have a strategy for dealing with it. Mm-hmm. And then it doesn't matter what the word is. You see? Right. right. So when I'm working with actors, I try and identify what are the issues that we're going to have uh, uh, dealing with this particular dialect that you're trying to do. Let's figure out those issues. Let's drill those issues so that you're comfortable with the issue. And then whatever words come, they come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at the very least, I can just say, oh, remember that thing we talked about? And the other benefit is you've heard me say it. Remember, repetition is the mother of skill. You've heard me say it. 10, 20 times, you've got a sheet that you've drilled. You're crystal clear about it. So if I need to remind you about it, it's like, oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. And then you just go back and put your tongue into a position that you've done time and time again. And that's what any coach does. You know, you practice yeah. these, you practice the, the, the movement, you practice, you practice, you practice. And then what it's really about is staying in the proper frame of mind and having the proper amount of relaxation to do what you know you're capable of doing Mm. Mm -hmm. so you've got this we're talking about the shorthand of using the i guess it's the international phonetic alphabet i guess this is what you use is is that right or or any uh, phonetic system that the actor wants to use Listen, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, any port in a storm, okay, Yeah, I will use anything that resonates with the actor. I'm not, I'm not teaching, I'm not teaching a course when I'm working with an actor. I, I'm actually solving problems. I know exactly what you mean, because as an English teacher, we have the phonemic script on the wall, the chart is on the wall. And sometimes when we get down into this stuff, which obviously happens every lesson, yes, then I go up and go, look here. And I point at some symbols on the, on the wall and I might transcribe the sentence or the word into the phonemic 
chart mm-hmm. and i can just tell my students are kind of going ah no you know we, we're trying to learn english no, not this you know they like we, we've we've already we're you know english is enough we don't have to learn another uh language as well right, so sometimes right. it's sometimes it's a bit intimidating for people when they see the all those different symbols and they they kind of think oh my god that's too much for me so you end up having to come up with your own version of um the phonemic script that you kind of agree with the people in the room at the time yep. and yeah, i guess that's what you're talking about that it's ultimately it's just um you just work with that individual and you agree on a on a way to describe the way these sounds are made and yes and, yes uh, but i'll tell you luke you better believe that i am focused on the international phonetic alphabet Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we may be coming up with something that you could use, but I, I'm focused on what this sound is, how it manifests. And, you know, all I'm saying is I don't need you to become an expert on how to explain it or the symbols, because once the cameras roll, that's not going to help you. I want you to mm-hmm. get it into your body and know how to use it. And, you know, uh, to whatever degree that is. Now, if I'm teaching a class, we'll talk about it. What I'm more interested in is you understanding how the how these categories fit together. I'm more interested in you understanding that there is a that there is a category that has this phonetic symbol. And I'm more interested in you understanding that there are a bunch of words that fit into that category more than I care about you knowing what the symbol is. Yeah. You're kind of just giving people a map which shows them. So if the map is um, a New York accent, if it's a map towards the New York accent, it's kind of like um, maybe the map isn't the best metaphor. Um, I I think um, a code maybe it's like decoding the New York accent um, sort of thing. Yeah, because Um, yeah, because you need to know that in this particular in this particular accent, all the words in this particular category uh, do this. Now, if there are exceptions, then at least you need to know what the you need to know what the category is, right? So let's just take the classic uh, New York category: the "aw" as in "law" sound, right? So yeah. "law," "fall," "ball," "tall," all of the you know and. Yeah. you'll know you'll know when you when you have a category when when things will rhyme in that category right that's part of what what makes you know um but i just want people to be as clear as possible about the words that go into that category because invariably when we have a problem somebody will say oh that's an all word oh i thought it was uh mm. an o word Right. And one of the things that, like, for example, that will get mixed up a lot is people people will have a a hard time understanding uh, the difference in sounds that really, depending on the accent, are very close together. So the uh as in cup sound in certain accents can be very close to the uh as in book sound. Hmm. And people get those confused, right? But Hmm. so here's what I'm saying. Even before you can distinguish them, if you can know that there's a cup category and all these words go there, that is more important than even knowing how to do it perfectly. Because eventually your mind will catch up. So essentially what you're saying there, I, I keep translating your dialect coach things into my English teacher sort of way of saying it. What you're saying there is that people need to be able to identify the things before they can produce them. You know, that they need to be able to hear the differences first and then produce them after. But uh, or, understanding or, comes or, first. or I'll, I'll even take it one step further, uh, which will help with the frustration. I agree with you. And I'll take it one step further to say Mm -hmm. you, it is not unusual and is probably likely that you will hear it before you can do it reliably. Right. And, and once you hear it, that's good news. That's the good news. Mm -hmm. When you start saying up, I just heard myself say that. I think I've been saying that word like that all morning. Mm-hmm. But you, mm-hmm. but you can't have those realizations 
uh, until you're aware of, uh, uh, this is the cups category and that's the book category. You know, our tongues are in different positions for these. So, so, uh, you know, uh, again, on the website, there are sound, uh, files, you know, for each one of these sound categories and people can just go in if they're interested in a general American sound. You know, we're, yeah. we're, we're going to the place where we're going to have different dialects, but right now, all the, the the categories I think are 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 still useful, but if you're going to use the sound files and repeat after the example on the page, then that would be for uh, for an American accent. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, what I need to do is actually, I mean, I already kind of do it in some of my um, some of my premium content, uh, Jerome. Yes, some of the uh, some of the uh, paid for extra special content that I produce. Uh, I'm doing some of these things, but um, what do you reckon? Do you reckon you can try and uh, help me uh, say a couple of sentences in an accent of your choice? Are you up for that? Uh, sure, sure. Why don't we? You would. Uh, uh, what's your favorite? What's your What's your personal favorite? I, you know, I don't have a personal favorite. You know, I mean, um, how is your uh, New York accent? Well, I don't know really, because whenever I think of a New York accent, I'm thinking, "Hey, I'm walking here." You know, that kind of thing. Right. I don't even know if it's really a New York accent, but I've got a sort of thing in my head, probably from. Uh, certain films like uh, Midnight Cowboy, you know, and right. I just imagine people trying to get taxis and like, hey, you know, yay. Hey, uh, uh, <laughs> well, let's do let's do something that is on the other uh, on the other side of the the spectrum uh, uh, from New York. Let's do a Southern accent. Yeah, great. Right? Let's do a Southern accent. So again, this is going to be just your basic southern accent right and it's going to have mm -hmm. you know and i'm not gonna i'm not going to get into the weeds specifically about you know uh what this may differ from so what we're going to do is we're going to take a few of the sounds and mm -hmm. we're gonna we're gonna and, and what i'm going to do is i'm gonna i'm gonna go on to uh my website right now dialect coaches corner and what i'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a couple of sounds and just so that I have the the words available to have you repeat, right? Okay. We're going to talk yeah. about some signature sounds, right? So yeah. you're doing it. You're doing it already. Uh, a, a little bit. You've, you've you slipped into yeah, I've, this. Other I've, next I've slipped into it. So let's say that if we take uh, the mid vowel, right? Mm -hmm. That would be that would be the mid vowel, the the cup sound, right? Um, okay. And so, uh, so just repeat after me. So just say uh, touch, touch, tuck, tuck, dove, dove, done, done. So you're just what you're just going to do is you're just going to you're just going to take a little bit of create a little bit of a scoop in that sound so just uh uh yeah because uh. i would say touch dove done but you're saying touch dove and it's all, it's a slight diphthong it's a slight diphthong it's a slight diphthong i love the way you say diphthong right there, there, there you I, go i'd say diphthong but diphthong so so now those are just a couple of words i'm gonna give you a couple of other words i'm gonna say rough rough run Run, cup, cup. I'll give you a couple of two-syllable words. I'm going to say puzzle, puzzle, bubble, bubble, fungus. <laughs> Sorry, fungus. Very nice. It's very good. You're you, you got a you got a very good ear. I could tell that though by listening to your programs. Uh, now uh, I'm gonna we're going to do a couple of phrases now. So we're just going to say uh, plus one. Plus one. Ugly cousin. Ugly cousin. Young uncle. Young uncle. You said my cousins are ugly. I kind of find her attractive myself. Right. Very good. You've done this before. So so then I, if I just go to uh to the sentences, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you just a sentence. I'm gonna say, um uh the sentence is a dozen consultants come with a truck. A dozen consultants come with a truck. 
right. don't, wait a minute. A dozen consultants come with a truck. That's okay. right. That's right. Now, it's so, so in the accent, we're just going to say a dozen consultants come with a truck. A dozen consultants. Uh, say, hmm, say it again for me. A dozen consultants come with a truck. A dozen consultants come with a truck. Right. And you see what you're doing? Remember that uh, that T next to the N there? You see what we're doing with consultants? We're not even making that T. Right. Consultants. A dozen consultants. No, no. A dozen consult. It's difficult to say it. Consultants. Consult. A dozen consultants. Mm. Well, I wouldn't worry about the, there are two T's. We're talking about the last one that you're not making. Okay. A dozen consult, consult, uh, consultants, consultants. That's right. A dozen consultants. That's right. Come with a truck. Yeah, that's right. Very good. Very good. So already you could see just with that, you, you, you've started taking on. And another thing that you're doing is that you're, you're, you're sort of, you're sort of laxing up all of your speech. You're, you're sort of laxing yeah. up your tongue. Right, your tongue doesn't have the uh, the same amount of muscularity. Yeah. Right, that's why they kind of call it a southern drawl. Make it, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, so I mean, that's just one sound, and then so we would go through. We would go through. Uh, you know, uh, we would pick four or five of them and uh, get some agreement on it you've got a very good uh, a very good air and 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 you you'd uh, cotton to it very quickly uh <laughs> yeah i kind of kind of enjoy doing it it's a lot of fun yes exactly it's a lot of fun and you actually then start to find other words because your mind is a is a is a a, a categorizing machine, isn't it? In our minds, aren't yeah. our minds that? So yeah. so we're 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 looking for other things that we can we can say. But if you if you if you're using the if you're using uh, the pages, then basically what you can do is you can you can just go through it and. And you don't have to worry about what to say. You could just worry about, you know, what what to do because part of the problem. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna stop now. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, part of the uh, not it, it, not because it's bad or I don't like it. I like oh, it quite I, a lot. I love it. I, I love, love it. it. It's so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I can already feel my mind trying to categorize. Uh, what did you say? I'm, it's already spending time categorizing <laughs> and putting some things, of these words, some of these words. Right. So we would look at, we would, of course, we'd look at ours. We'd look at other vowels that got that, that kind of turned into diphthongs, pure vowels, you know, uh, single stage vowels that might get turned into diphthongs. And, and we, we look at that now. Now that's just a sort of a, that's what you call a, a kind of a general, a general Southern. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and I would say a a a, a general uh, uh, a general Eastern Southern. Right. Because right. the further west you go, the more it subtly starts to change. Right. Mm. So it and and it's and it's a little bit different. By the time you get out to Texas, it's a little bit different. Right. Mm. It's a little shorter, but you're still doing a lot of the same things. But it it's kind of it. And and it's certainly got a it's certainly got a a particular style to it, and but it's but it's it's shorter, you know. When, mm. Once the further west you get, right, right, and yeah. and of course this, you know, I mean these are what I've just taught you is a stereotype, yeah. But the key thing is suddenly now your ear starts to listen for that and what if we were to do a specific dialect say we were going to do an atlanta dialect or if we were going to do a mississippi those are two different dialects but but they both have attributes um of this general southern that we would talk about and then your job or my job would be to help you hear based on the sample what uh, 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 what the actual person is doing that you're trying to get closer to, and there's one other thing that I will say for your uh, for your students, <clears throat> uh, and I'm sure that you uh, 
have probably already emphasized this, but I just want to reinforce it. Mm. Having vocal models, best thing you could do. What do you mean by vocal models? You you need to actually, well, it's what they're doing when they're watching television. You need to have somebody who you're modeling. Um, and in the world that we live in now with the content that's out there, it's easier now than it ever was before. And when I'm working with an actor, I'll say, let's find somebody whose voice you like, a sample that you relate to and you can uh, you can you can start to use that person to actually hear how that person makes vowels and consonants uh, together how they articulate mm, listeners i wonder who your vocal sample could be mm. if you're trying to learn british english maybe <laughs> God, if only there was someone if only there was someone who maybe had recorded their voice a lot and published it all on the well, internet. Well, I've I've already started to do that with you. I mean, I've <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> really <laughs> time to uh, pick up my accent. Well, you know, you've got a wonderful you've got a wonderful uh, I I listened to your whole uh, program on um uh, received pronunciation. It was uh, the yeah the received pronunciation and the uh, dialects yes, uh, or yes or sort of non-standard dialects mm-hmm. yeah the, re- the fairly recent episode I did all about yeah the yeah main it was wonderful main difference it's wonderful and I love the way that you you know parsed it in terms of how it would manifest itself in different situations because what you started to do as you were talking about what makes your dialect more standard than one of your friends that you were talking about, even though he, if I remember correctly, you were saying even though he came from an environment that would seem like he would have the more uh, standard dialect, but in fact, he didn't, if I remember correctly. But you were using, but you were actually speaking about very, very specific uh, stylistic choices of how... uh, uh, medial T's were used, uh, you know, things that got elided and things that didn't get elided, you know, and you were sort of saying this might have that sort of perception. So, but one of the things that I will always do is say, listen for those things and find somebody's voice that you, you know, like and who you relate to. If you relate to the voice in some way, use it as a model. And copy it, you know, Mm. and think about how that person would say it, because that's all an impression is anyway. Yeah, this is fascinating to me because I love doing impressions. It's just fun. You know, for me, it's just fun. I also do stand up and I like to do some impressions in stand up, too. But just from just for me, it's just so much fun trying to copy someone in the way that they speak, learning the little ticks that they have. Like I've been trying to, you know, I've been learning how to do Paul, Paul McCartney. Yes. You know? And it's that sort of, a lot of things that he does, a uh, little head wobble, you know, <laughs> little sort of, a lot of pointing with the finger when he's speaking, you know. Um, and it's just so fun to examine. And, the, you know, I think the reason why I love doing Paul is because um, he's a hero of mine as well. Yes. I just love watching him in interviews. But that's very interesting that I hope that people – listening to this learning English can try and sort of do the same thing and inject some fun into it that ultimately it's about playing around and trying to kind of sort of become another person just for a moment, you know? Um, I, I don't know if it's possible uh, on this. If, if this is anything like zoom, it's probably isn't possible. And, uh, uh, but is there's, we can't speak at the same time. Can we? Um, I don't know. Uh, um, we can try. What, what, well, what are you thinking? Well, this is something that I will have people oftentimes do as well. So what I'm going to do, if I were trying to, if I were trying to learn your particular speaking style, and I don't mean uh-huh. copy you, but just learn your particular speaking style. This is something that I would do. So I want you to tell me a story. Okay. Um, and it's, I, I want it to be something that you know well enough to, to that you can actually keep it going even with a distraction because I'm going to give you a distraction. <laughs> All right. Oh, God. Right. I think I'm going to quickly think of a story that I can tell you. Um, oh, God. Okay. All right. All right. Here we go. Go ahead. 
Oh dear! Oh this dear. is the first thing that the comes to my mind. To my mind, even though even I sort though of, I sort of hesitate sort about of hesitate telling the story. telling the story. The thing is, the thing so, is, it's a story so, about doing story stand-up about doing comedy. Stand-up comedy, and already my and already going, no, 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 tell his tell his story. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I keep going? I, so, were you, did you hear what I was doing? And maybe it yeah. didn't even work, you know, uh, but. Because I have headphones on, and I encourage people to do this with headphones. This is a this is something that I use quite a lot, uh, and it's really useful too. So I have headphones on, and as you were talking, the only thing that I could focus on is mm-hmm. listening to what you said. That's all yeah. I could. I could. I didn't have time to worry about what I was saying. I was just laser focused on yours. And consequently, I don't have a time to judge what I'm, what I'm saying or how I'm saying it. I don't even know how I did. Right. What's important is I'm just like following you and following whatever I can. I'm following whatever trail. So I'm not, I'm not judging myself. I'm not, um, I'm not trying to do you. I'm just following you. I'm mirroring you as best I can. Yeah. We call it shadowing. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if you guys call it if you call it shadowing too, but um, yeah, shadowing and and yeah, it's uh, a lot of people talk about that in in language learning, um, doing exactly that, and it sort of does cut out the effective filter. This this thing, which is, as you say, um, that feeling of judging yourself, right? And like you don't have time to worry about you don't uh, yourself. You kind of take yourself out of the picture completely and you just focus only on what the other person is saying. Yes. It's really interesting that you use that too. Yeah. 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 That's so it's, fascinating. so it's, you know, finding a model that you like and then doing that kind of thing with the model, you know, um, mm. could be really, uh, useful. I got to tell you, Luke, this has been a pleasure, but boy, you have a lot of editing to do. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's all right. That's okay. <laughs> um, I do a little bit, but that's all right. Um, Jerome, thank you so much for talking to me and to my listeners on the podcast. It's been absolutely fascinating. I will do like a proper introduction and uh, an ending bit where I, you know, uh, give some more details about sort of um, your uh, your career and, and some things like that and where people can find you. But it's uh, it's been really interesting. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And make sure that your listeners know that uh, at dialectcoachescorner.com, they can sign up for a free username and password uh, while we're uh, getting the site up and they can try the tools uh, at no cost. That is very nice of you. Thank you very much. And uh, have a lovely rest of the day. Absolutely. It was a pleasure, Luke. Looking forward to continuing to listen to your programs. And uh, uh, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks. Yeah. Good luck with the TV show and take care. Cheers, man. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Right. So that was Dialect Coach Jerome Butler. Thank you again to Jerome for all that information that he gave us there. Very interesting stuff indeed. And I think, yes, I would also like to say thank you to Jerome on behalf of all my listeners. Thank you. That's all the listeners all screaming. Thank you. And cheering and applauding. So for me, that was fascinating and also reassuring to know that Jerome uses more or less the same methods and approaches in the TV and film industries as we use in our English teaching, or at least I use, we use, you know, many of us use the same approaches. Um, I think Jerome gave us some really valuable insights into how people can actually change their accents. As I said before, this is a huge and complex subject, so we only scratch the surface here. If you'd like to know more from Jerome, and um, if you'd like to use the tools he mentioned, the tools that he's created on his website, then visit his website, which is dialectcoachescorner.com dialect coaches corner dialect coaches corner okay so that's a corner for coaches what kind of coaches dialect coaches so it's a dialect coaches corner.com okay you can create a free profile there and then just start exploring and practicing it is for a general american english accent though 
as Jerome pointed out, so you might want to bear that in mind. Let me now just recap, though, and sum up the main bits of advice in that conversation with Jerome. If you found it a bit difficult to follow all the way through, or if you found it a bit difficult to pick out all the specifics, then this summary should help you. I'm going to try and keep it quick. Here we go. So summarizing advice from the conversation with Jerome. So first thing, learn the phonemic script because it will help you become more aware of the different sounds that are used in English. Okay, Uh, there are apps that you can use to do this um, on your phone. This may be the most convenient way. Um, My recommendation for an app for just learning the phonemic script would be um, Sounds by Macmillan. I think that's got to be the best one. There is a British Council one, but to be completely honest, the the Macmillan one I think is better. Sounds by Macmillan. I've mentioned it on the podcast before. This will really help you to identify and then reproduce specific sounds that are used in English. British English in the case of of, uh, of that app. Okay. Sounds. In fact, the, the, the full title of the app is Sounds, the pronunciation app. So Sounds, the pronunciation app, contains various tasks that will help you learn the sounds, practice recognising them, transcribing words phonetically and more. And that's exactly the sort of thing you need to do in order to get to know the phonemic script. It's it's what I had to do when I learnt it when I was, uh, you know, becoming a teacher. So as I said, the full name of the app is Sounds, the pronunciation app. Apparently it's available for iOS and Android devices. Um, I'm not sponsored by them or anything, but, you know, Macmillan... (coughs) If you want to maybe just, I don't know, what what could Macmillan do? Throw a book at me. Ah, thanks. There you go, said Macmillan, throwing a huge dictionary at me. Ah. Um, anyway, Macmillan, if you want to, you know, just send me loads of free stuff in return for this little shout out I'm giving you here, then uh, feel free. Just don't literally throw any dictionaries at me, please. Uh, that could be dangerous. So anyway, the full name is Sounds, the pronunciation app. The best way to get it actually is to just get it directly from the Macmillan website and you will find the link there on the page for this episode. We just Google uh, Sounds, the pronunciation app, and then you will be able to find it on the website and download it there. I couldn't find it in the app store on my iPhone for some reason, but it is available. Um, So that's the first thing. Learn the phonemic script and use apps to do it. Second second thing, uh, categorise words by the different sounds. For example, what is the vowel sound in the stressed syllable of the word? Okay, so you can take all the different vowel sounds, that's the single vowel sounds and double vowel sounds, and then consider those vowel sounds to be like categories and just take words and just try to put them in the different categories. Um, vowel sounds would be good for doing that. So we're talking about minimal pairs practice putting uh, min- minimal pairs are actually words that have very similar vowel sounds like work and walk for example i go to work and uh, how do you go to work i i walk i walk to work or uh those two sounds are very similar so you need to find that you know oh, what actually totally um to be totally honest with you a book would help it would really help you do this. A book like Ship or Sheep. Yep, Ship or Sheep by Anne Baker can really help. So categorise words by different sounds. Also, certain consonant sounds. You can categorise words by consonant sounds, especially things like TH sounds and also ED endings for different regular verbs and things. A textbook like Ship or Sheep by Anne Baker can help because in that book, all the different vowel sounds are listed chapter by chapter, and you can practice recognising, categorising and repeating words with those sounds. Other pronunciation books are available, like, for example, the Pronunciation in Use series by, I believe it's Cambridge University Press. And they'll have all the different vowel sounds and also the consonant sounds too. And ED endings and TH sounds and stuff. Okay. Mechanical practice is important. That means repetition, repetition, repetition. And just working on your mouth and working on where the positions are of the mouth for different sounds. What did uh, Jerome say? I think he said repetition is the mother of skill. Is that what he said? I think it is. And it's reassuring to know this. And he's a man 
with a proven track record of results. He knows that to help someone change the way they speak, it's a combination of heightening your awareness of the different sounds and how they're made, then mechanical practice with those sounds until they enter your body um, and you acquire the uh, ability to quickly switch between the categories and work out how to say the words in the accent you've chosen. So again, practice identifying which sound is being used, practice categorizing words uh, into those different sounds over and over again, then practice saying these words by repeating after someone. Again, Ship or Sheep can help because there's an audio CD, other books or websites may be available. And of course, Jerome's website, Dialect Coaches Corner. But there are there are many things to take into account. It's not just vowel sounds. If I'd be if I'd had more time with Jerome, we might have got into other things like intonation, connected speech, elision of sounds, sentence stress, weak forms, and all that stuff. Why don't you make a pronunciation course, Luke? Well, I'm sort of doing that partially in the premium uh, subscription, but a, a full pronunciation course would be a good idea. It can be hard to do this practice on your own, so you might also need a personal coach of some kind, like a one-to-one teacher who can work closely with you. Uh, You might find one on italki. Again, go to teacherluke.co.uk slash talk to get started with italki and you know as this that deal still stands by the way i don't mention them at the beginning of episodes anymore but uh, i still do have that deal with italki where you can get a free voucher which is basically worth a free lesson from italki when you book some lessons using my url all right um anyway let me point you towards jerome's website again again yes again what was the address again? It was uh, dialectcoachescorner.com. That's right. That's where you can contact Jerome. You can create a free account to access all the resources and more. And remember, that is if you're looking for a general American accent or perhaps more specific regional accents in the USA. For British English, well, of course, I'd recommend my premium subscription or the other resources I've mentioned, or in fact, all of them. So work with someone, work with resources designed to help you with this. Alternatively, you can practice simply repeating after someone whose accent you want to copy. And if you want to copy my accent, you can repeat words and sentences like me. Do this either by shadowing, which is what Jerome um, demonstrated, mirror, mirroring, shadowing, whatever you want to call it. Just try to repeat as you listen. Or you could perhaps pause and repeat certain certain lines or phrases. Or you can use the pronunciation drills in my premium episodes because they are designed to help you repeat after me. And I focus my attention on things like sentence stress and other specific features. But practice, practice, practice. Have fun with it too. But also remember that it is a question of personal choice. Please don't feel that you have to sound exactly like a native speaker. I understand why you would want that as your goal. Okay, it's a reasonable goal and many people achieve it. And I'm sure that many of you have decided you want the best possible level of English that you can achieve. You want to stand out from other people. That's fine. But um, in my opinion, I think it's totally fine and reasonable to retain traces of your native language when you speak. Traces. I mean, you know, obviously you need to be intelligible. This is the main thing. And if your accent is so strong that people can't understand you, then that needs to be fixed. But the rest of it is just a question of identity and a, and a question of personal choice. Having a bit of an accent when you speak, that's part of who you are. Like Jerome said, perhaps the only reason to completely lose all trace of your first language in your English accent is if you're either an actor or a spy, I suppose. And I've made that point before. I don't know. Do spies... How do spies work these days? I don't know. If you're a spy, get in touch on the website. Um Yes, you can use your code name if you like. Also, I think it requires a lot of time, a lot of dedication and effort to work on your accent to the same level as a professional actor. This isn't always a realistic proposition for learners of English who are also busy in their lives. So working on being clear is the main thing. And if you have a regional accent in English, then that's fine. It's part of who you are. Just like someone from Liverpool has a Liverpool accent. Someone from Glasgow has a Glasgow accent. Someone from Essex has an Essex accent. You can have an accent from your country as long as people understand you. 
Uh, it's all a question of personal choice at the end of the day, but there it is. I think speaking to Jerome shows us that there are ways of working on the way that you sound if you are prepared to put in the time and the effort. I also wonder sometimes if some people are more naturally talented at changing their pronunciation than others. Do you think that some people are just talented and some, you know, some people just can't change their accent? That is a question I'm not completely able to answer at this moment, but what do you think? Do you think some people are naturally better than others at matters of pronunciation or or not? We're nearly ready to finish. A couple of expressions here that um, that uh, you heard that I felt I should clarify, although the episode is nearly done. One expression was uh, this. Jerome said, my tongue is firmly in my cheek. If you say that your tongue is in your cheek or if you do something in a tongue in cheek way, this just means that you're not being serious. Jerome was talking about, you know, we were talking about uh, the difference between a dialect and an accent. And he said that calling himself a dialect coach uh, would mean that he would be paid more. I think the pay bracket is higher if you call yourself a dialect coach. But he was doing he was saying that with his tongue in his cheek, meaning he's just joking, really. But uh, maybe it's a point. I don't know. Maybe the word dialect sounds a bit more impressive than the word accent. Um, Another expression was this. We're splitting hairs. We're splitting hairs here. If you are splitting hairs, it means you're making a very, very small distinction. Okay. A hair, ping, you like take a hair from your head, boink. And then you try to split that hair in two. Obviously, it's a tiny, tiny little detail, a very detailed work. Splitting hairs is like making a very, very small distinction, which is almost um, so small, it's, it doesn't make any, it doesn't really matter. So, um, you know, Jerome could be called an accent coach or a dialect coach, it doesn't really matter. And trying to be specific about them is kind of like splitting hairs. Um, although, since that's kind of my job, it's sort of my job to split hairs um, in terms of vocab and grammar and stuff. To be clear, dialect does refer to the words and the grammar, and accent refers to the pronunciation. But I think that Jerome does both. I mean, if he's preparing me to be on The Walking Dead, then he's going to have to teach me how, you know, all the words and structures that are used by people in that part of the world, as well as the sounds that they make. So it's fair enough. Okay, but that is it. That's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. Thank you again to Jerome for his um, his wonderful input during the episode. And I'll speak to you again on the podcast soon. The Whisper Lep competition is coming very soon. Okay, right, fine. Uh, that's it then. Have a lovely day, morning, afternoon, night, uh, or lunch or evening or dinner or breakfast or drive or walk or just lying on the sofa, whatever it is that you're doing. I hope you enjoy it and I'll speak to you soon. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye. Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.